Turn in your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 11. We're going to do a study tonight to answer a question, what did they go to see? What did they go to see? Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. Okay. I'm reading from the New International Version. You can follow along in whatever translation of God's word you have. We're going to concentrate on verses 7 through 9, which is the heart of our Bible study tonight, but I'm going to read uh, much of the context. We'll begin with verse 1 and read through verse 19 of Matthew chapter 11. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, Go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. As John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No, those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way before you. I tell you the truth. Among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who was to come. He who has ears, let him hear. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplace calling out to others, we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not mourn. For John came, neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The Son of Man came, eating and drinking, and they say he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors, tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved by her actions." Let's pray again. Father, we thank you for your word and we ask for your spirit, whom your son promised he would send when he ascended into heaven and that that Holy Spirit would remind us of the things that Jesus taught and lead us into all truth, bringing those things to remembrance and making them alive in our hearts and minds. Let that spirit work through your servant and your people tonight as we look into your word. In Jesus' name, amen. What did they go to see? That's what Jesus was asking. To give you the background of the text, John was in prison. Any of you remember why he was in prison? Because he spoke out publicly against Herod's sin of adultery in taking his brother's wife from his brother and marrying her. John spoke out and said, Scripture teaches this is a sin. This is adultery. But 
Herod refused to repent. He was careful about dealing with John because he knew how popular John was among the common people. But then one day his stepdaughter danced before him. And he was so impressed, he said, I'll give you anything you want up to half the kingdom. It's yours. She went and spoke to her mother, Herod's wife. And she said, tell him you want the head of John the Baptist on a platter. So Herod had John arrested, but he was hesitant at first to have him decapitated because of the the popularity. But he did have him thrown in prison, and later he did have him beheaded, took his life. So here is John in prison. Now it's interesting because John is sending his followers to Jesus with a question. Are you the one we were looking for? The anointed one? The Messiah? Mashiach? The Christ? Various titles mean the same thing. The Messiah, the anointed one. Now, what's interesting is John had seen Jesus before. Actually, he had felt the presence of the Lord when he was in the presence of Jesus' mother, Mary. Any of you remember that story? Mary went to visit John's mother, who was her cousin. And when John's mother saw Mary... John the Baptist, still inside his mother's womb, leaped for joy because he recognized this is the mother of the anointed one. This is the one whose forerunner I will be. This is the one whom I will proclaim. So even before he was born, three months before he was born, he was seeing Jesus in the Spirit. And reacting to it, recognizing who he was. And then later, when Jesus began his ministry, he came before John. And he asked to be baptized. What was John's response? His response was, you ought to be baptizing me. Real men and women of God are humble. And that's what John the Baptist was. He recognized this. Now, he went on to recognize who Jesus was and proclaimed him as Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he also, when he baptized Jesus, saw the Holy Spirit descend as a dove upon Jesus. He recognized who Jesus was. And yet here he is in jail, sending his followers to ask Jesus the question, are you the one we were waiting for? You see, even the most godly of people can at times experience doubt. He was sure who Jesus was, and now he's unsure. We can only speculate as to why. The Bible doesn't tell us exactly why. Had he expected Jesus to become king by now? Well, I I thought if he was really the Messiah, he would restore the kingdom to Israel and do it now because the kingdom of God has to come now. I was preparing the way with my preaching and, and my baptizing telling people to repent, and he has not yet become king. What's happening? Had he expected Jesus to be king by now, or was he disillusioned, feeling that Jesus had abandoned him in jail? He had a relationship with Jesus, not only in the natural, but in the spiritual. He was the forerunner to the coming Jesus Christ. And yet, Jesus did not rescue him from jail, apparently never even sent anyone to inquire how he was doing. 
Did John perhaps feel abandoned by Jesus? Was that why he was wondering, is this really the Messiah that I believed he was? Jesus offered an answer, born of evidence. He didn't ask John to simply take him at his word. He offered him evidence. Verse 6, looking back to our text here. Verse 6. He tells him, his, his followers, to go back and tell John this. Report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cured. The deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. He says, go back and tell them that. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Now, what's interesting is in the Luke account of this story, it tells us that John's followers had already gone back to him and told him the things that Jesus had been doing, including the raising of the dead, the healing of the blind, the healing of the deaf. And yet Jesus said, tell him again. Tell him again. Remind him. Jesus could have just demanded, take my word. Put faith in my word. But he went beyond that. He gave him evidence. And he has done that to others as well. In John chapter 14 and verse 11, he was speaking to Philip. Actually, we could go back and, and begin it at the start of that chapter 11 because it was close to the time when Jesus was going to be giving his life for all of them and for you and for me and everyone who will put their trust in him and repent of their sins. And he was telling them about what was going to happen, how he was going to be abandoned, how he was going to be put to death, crucified. And Peter, in, in the previous chapter, John chapter 10, said, Oh, no, we won't let that happen. Jesus said, Peter, you will deny me three times. And someone is going to betray me as well. He didn't identify at that point who it was. He did that later at the Last Supper. Then he went on to say, but... Don't be troubled by what's going to happen because I am going to go to my father's house in heaven and in my father's house are many, in the King James it says mansions, in the NIV it says rooms, whatever it is, it's going to be glorious. So you're going to come with me. And Thomas, you might remember his nickname, the doubter. Thomas said, well, well, we don't know where you're going. How are we going to get there? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but through me. And then Philip says, well, show us the Father, and that will be sufficient. Jesus just said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Show us the Father, that will make us. I've been, where have you been all these years? That's in essence what Jesus said to Philip. Where have you been all these years? And then he went on to encourage him to believe his words. He says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. And he said, if nothing else, believe that because of the miracles you have seen. Sometimes God simply says, trust my word. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet they believe. But so often he also offers us evidence of some kind. And that's what he did to Philip. And that's what he was doing with John who was sitting in jail so troubled over what had been happening. Look at what I have done. Look at the miracles that the Father has done through me. Jesus 
declared as blessed those whose faith in him reaches beyond their doubts. And every one of us has doubts at time. I wish I could tell you I have never doubted in my life. I have. And still have times I wrestle with doubt. So do you if you will be honest with yourself and honest before God. But those who choose to trust God, to put their faith in him, will cling even in the midst of doubt coming through those trials victoriously because they choose to trust God. And Jesus declared, blessed are those whose faith in him reaches beyond their doubts. In fact, in chapter 11 and verse 6, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Blessed is the man who continues to believe no matter what happens, no matter what other people say about me. Believe, believe. And there are a lot of other people out there saying how foolish to believe in Jesus. We look beyond our doubts. We put our trust in him. And we experience blessing in this life and greater blessing yet to come in eternity. Now, he's asking, as we said in verse 7, as John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the desert, des into the desert to see? Now, I want to deal with that through these three verses, verses 7, 8, and 9 of this chapter. Was the attraction to John due to his populist appeal? What do you think? Let's look again at verse 7 and read the entirety of the verse now. What did you go out in the desert to see? A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. Now, we're going to talk more about that prophetic role that John the Baptist played. But let's just talk about this concept now of following John out into the desert because he has that populist appeal. Who are the kind of people today in this culture, unfortunately, who have populist appeal? Unfortunately, the vast majority of them are people who do not believe in Jesus, do not believe in the word of God, and believe in lifestyles that are far against the word of God and his principles. John was not the kind of people, kind of person who would draw a crowd because of his popular appeal. A populist keeps a finger to the wind and an eye on the poles. John was not that kind of person. How many celebrities and how many politicians do just that? Because they want to go with what the popular movement is right now. What is politically correct? What is part of the woke movement? John didn't care about that stuff. So they didn't go out to see this guy who kept his finger at the wind and his eye on the poles. But American culture is a lot like that nowadays. American culture, armed with the power of today's educational institutions and the media, exerts tremendous pressure to conform. If you say you believe that homosexuality is a sin, they call you a hater. You're despicable. Do we hate homosexuals? No. We believe homosexuality is a sin. God loves homosexuals because he loves sinners. He loved us when we were still sinners. But we need to be willing to see past the woke culture. I, I, I can hardly believe the change in this country 
The one I grew up in is very different than the one today. And the changes have come slowly. Because the enemy knows if he had all at once presented the kind of values that are being propagated by the popular culture today, all at once, people would have stood up and cried out against it. But little bits at a time. And using the persuasion of the educational system who are teaching things that are not biblical and not true, and the media that promotes and backs them up and backs up the politicians pushing in that direction. What is popular is not always right. In fact, I would say nowadays, more often than not, what is popular is anything but right. We have to watch that. John was not a populist. And John was not a reed swayed by the wind. That's what Jesus said of him. Would you go out to see a reed swayed by the wind? Everything that happens in the culture, oh, I'll just move with that. I don't want to cause a fuss. I, I, don't, want, I, I don't want to speak out and be called a hater. John was willing to speak out against sin against hypocrisy because he loved God. A reed in, in this case was likely referring to papyrus, which is an unstable, long, thin, and easily swayed plant. John refused to be moved by public opinion. He was faithful to God's word, preaching faith and repentance without compromise. That's what got him in jail to begin with. He spoke out against the sin of adultery. Did he tell Herod, God hates you? No. He told Herod, God hates adultery. There's a very clear distinction there. The old saying I grew up hearing, and it is true and biblical, is hate sin, love the sinner. Amen. And that's what God does and if we are his followers, we will do the same. John, John was a God pleaser, not a crowd pleaser. It's important to make that distinction. I love what Jesus said, and it is my desire how often I pray. In fact, I pray it probably every day, maybe multiple times a day. Jesus said, I do always those things which please the Father. I wish I could tell you I'm like Jesus, and I do always those things which please the Father. All I can tell you is like the Apostle Paul urged, I'm aiming for perfection, falling short, but aiming for it. And I'm always praying, I always want to do everything, every moment of every day, those things that please you. And John was a God pleaser, not a populist. Okay, so the attraction to John was not due to his popular appeal. Then I ask another question. Was his appeal based upon his sophisticated image? Yeah. Let's take a look at verse 8 again. If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Guess who put him in jail? Someone who was in fine clothes in a king's palace. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. And we'll talk about that more at length. He had no sophisticated image. You see, image attempts to impress with an appeal to the eye. Boy, this culture is that way right now, isn't it? Appeal to the eye. Now, does that mean that appeal to the eye is totally wrong and totally sin? No. God created beautiful things. I'm inspired every time I look at this creation. And imagine what it was like back in the Garden of Eden before the curse. 
it's beautiful now. Imagine what it was like before sin was here. Before animals killed and ate one another. What a beautiful thing. So God is not against beauty. He is not against an appeal to the eye. He is against making that more important than pleasing God. That's what is to be number one. Madison Avenue teaches that image is everything. And how many in the public eye go for that very thing? I want you to, th- I don't ever want you to, I don't want your cameras around when I'm doing something that you don't think is a good idea. Politicians are always looking for what they call photo ops. Something that makes them look good. Whether it's strictly their appearance or whether them being around someone that, let's say, is poor. To make you think I really care about the poor. Now, I'll grant you, thank you, there are a few politicians who really do care about the poor. But with many of them, it's nothing but a facade to promote their image, to get votes. And you know how many politicians go to the national capital or the state capitals and get rich? There are good men and women out there in government, but far too many of them are looking to appeal to the eye for photo ops, for (sighs) thinking that's what counts, what people think of me, how I appear to them. Sometimes the church puts too much emphasis on looking good, looking too much like the world. It's easy for us to slip into that. Now, again... Does that mean we should have an ugly sanctuary? No. Does that mean that we, as Christians, should not dress well or groom well, take a bath once every couple of weeks or so, comb your hair? No. It's the emphasis that's put on it. That is the key. And it is not the outward appearance that counts the most. It is what is in the heart. What did God say to Samuel when when David's father brought him before him? And he had looked at all these big husky sons. And then comes this little boy, David. This can be the one that you're anointing as king over Israel? Man looks on what? The outward appearance, God looks on the heart. That's what John was concerned with. That's what we need to be concerned with. You see, real substance is concerned with the heart. Appearance becomes secondary. It's not that it doesn't count. It's that it becomes secondary. It's not the most important thing. What's in here? is what is so important. John did not live in a palace. In fact, he was rejected by secular and religious leadership. His headquarters was where? In the wilderness. In the desert. And that's what Jesus was asking about when when he talked about John and, and how so many of the common people respected him, and went out to hear him speak and preach and teach and baptize. What was it that took you out there? No one says, I love to be in the desert. At least nobody I know. (laughs) I want to be out in the wilderness where there's nothing comfortable. Not too many people say that. Not the crowd. The crowd wants to be in places that look beautiful and feel comfortable. But something made them go out to the wilderness, to the desert. Not somebody who was in a palace or in fine clothes. Not someone eating fine cuisine. 
we are told that John the Baptist ate locust pods and wild honey. By the way, uh, the King James says locusts and honey, but we understand that the original meaning of the Greek word there was locust pods. It was a plant. He wasn't eating insects, although I don't think there's anything wrong necessarily with I'm not into it, but I don't think there's anything biblically wrong with eating insects. But it was probably speaking about his eating a simple means of nutrition, locust pods and honey, simple things, not that fine cuisine that all those who opposed him. And it wasn't just the secular leaders like Herod. It was unfortunately the religious leaders. Now, when I use the term religion there, I'm using it in the negative sense. The word itself is neutral. Kind of reminds me of television. Now, I didn't grow up in that. I grew up in a Christian home, but I didn't grow up in a home where they said television was evil. But they did say certain programs were not appropriate and were not good. But it's the same way with that. It is that you do what is right. And that's what we are looking for. It can be good. It can be evil. Television can be used to promote the gospel. It can be used to promote all kinds of rebellion against God and movement towards sin. What is it? John was not someone who impressed people with his appearance, even the way he dressed. Now, John was... His ministry was compared to Elijah. And Elijah-like spirit was to be upon John. In fact, in in the first chapter of the gospel according to Luke, it says that. He he had the power and authority that Elijah had. And, And what's interesting is it seems that he even kind of dressed like Elijah. Because the Bible tells us in 1 Kings that Elijah was dressed in hair, and a belt. And what does it tell us about John? Camel hair and a belt. Simple clothing. He wasn't trying to impress anybody with the way he looked. Now, do we have to go around wearing camel hair and a leather belt? No. But we do need to realize that, what again, what is most important is in the heart. Now, what else is interesting about the parallel between John the Baptist and Elijah is John the Baptist, who had been used mightily of God and even proclaimed who Jesus was, was now sitting in jail wondering, having doubts. Do you remember Elijah on Mount Carmel? Challenging the prophets of Baal, calling down fire from heaven, Miraculous, supernatural event. And then, as he left that place, he outran the king's chariot. How many men can outrun a horse-drawn chariot? How many men can outrun a horse? I can't even outrun my dog. (laughs) Miraculous victory he had in front of so many thousands of people. And and yet, when the queen... You see, Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, was to Elijah, in a sense, what Herod was to John the Baptist. She sent a messenger. She said, you you tell that Elijah, he's going to be dead. I'm putting a price on his head. And this man who had had a tremendous supernatural victory over idolatry, bringing many back to the true faith in the true God, now goes and sits under a tree and says, kill me, God. I'm no better than my father's. Have you ever felt that way? Yeah. 
there are all, all there are times for all of us when we feel down, even after maybe right after we've won a great victory. That's often when the enemy comes with the biggest. We think we, he'll hit us just when we're down. He'll hit us anytime he wants, including right after a victory. So there's another parallel between John the Baptist and Elijah, and you see that with other servants of God as well. So when you go through these hard times, don't think that you're alone and that you're a terrible person. You're not. You're a human being who needs to continue to aim for perfection. Are you going to fall short sometimes? Are you going to have doubts? Yes, but don't. Don't wallow in those doubts. Don't settle for those doubts. Now, again, we go back to verse 9. And Jesus said, then what did you go out to see? (laughs) Wasn't a reed swayed by the wind? Wasn't a man dressed in fine clothes? No. You went out to see a prophet. Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. Because he was talking about the one who came in the spirit and authority of Elijah the prophet. That's who you went out to see. Now, what is a prophet? Well, let's look at the Hebrew word, Nebih which is the word used in the Old Testament for prophet. The original meaning is somewhat uncertain, but it's generally supposed to signify the bubbling up of the divine message, just as water issues from a hidden fountain. I love that. I love that picture. A hidden fountain. That's what we are to be, not promoting ourselves and saying, look at me, I got the power of God to do this and to speak this. No. What does it say about Moses, who led millions of Jews out of bondage in Egypt and toward the promised land and put up with, he put up with a lot of stuff during those 40 years in the wilderness. Boy. But I'll tell you, he Stuck with it. What does Hebrews tell us? One of the many things about faith in that book. It says of the Old Testament saints who through faith and patience obtained the promises. And what does it say about Moses? This man who, wow, he confounded all the false prophets and and sorcerers of Egypt. He confounded the Pharaoh. He did miracles, or I should say the Lord did miracles through him. And what does it say at the close of his life in the end of Deuteronomy? He was the meekest man on the face of the earth. Those words were likely written by Joshua, his assistant, as anointed by the Holy Spirit, meekest man on the face of the earth. And what did Jesus say to those who would consider following him? I am meek and lowly. If anyone had the right to be proud and arrogant, it was God in flesh. But he wasn't. He was meek and lowly. And he submitted himself to the Father, not bragging about himself. A prophet bubbling up like a hidden spring is a spokesman, a mouthpiece for God. Wow. What a tremendous responsibility. It's an honor, too, but what a responsibility. Now, I do not have a prophetic ministry. God has called me to ministry. The prophetic ministry is not one of them. I'm not saying I haven't prophesied at times I have, but that's not my ministry primarily. But I will tell you, I feel the tremendous responsibility. When I was asked by pastor to fill in for him, And I asked him, did you want me to continue with the study on Acts? 
And, and he said, no. He said, I actually prefer that you, you teach whatever the Lord lays on your heart. I prayed. I prayed, Lord, what do you want me to teach tonight? And I will tell you this. In fact, I discussed this with a pastor some years ago. I, I can't tell you why. I can't tell you whether it is uh, the anointing of God or it's something about the basic temperament he gave me, but I don't get nervous about speaking in front of people, not on the basis of, oh, oh I'm speaking. I mean, I've spoken in front of uh, scores of people like tonight. I've spoken in front of thousands of people. And I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I'm comfortable with it. But what I do feel every time I go to speak on God's behalf, to preach or teach the word of God is this, the responsibility to say what God would have me say. I will tell you that anything that is taught from the word of God is good and beneficial. But I also am of this conviction that any time those of us who are called to preach and teach are speaking before a crowd, a given crowd, a given place, a given time, I believe God has a specific message from his word for that people, that time, that place. And that's the responsibility I feel as a tremendous weight every time I go to speak before people. Can I tell you that every time I've been 100% on, that I had just a message? I don't know that. I frankly have doubts. But I will tell you, I intend to. And that's the responsibility I have because I am God's spokesman when I stand behind this pulpit and open the word of God. And that's what John the Baptist was, a prophet. He had to speak God's word, whether it was popular or not. And prophets often bear rejection. Whoa. And we, we read that in this very same 11th chapter of the gospel according to Matthew. We read that in verses 16 through 19 as he talks about this crowd. In fact, I will tell you that verse 17 speaks to me of the politically correct culture we live in right now. He, he said, well, let me, let me read verse uh, uh, 16 as well. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to others, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. We're telling you what to do. There's one primary authority I answer to. Now, do I have to answer to some degree to earthly authority too? Absolutely. But the primary authority I answer to and we all answer to is God. Is God. And there are times we have to say no to earthly authority. Like the disciples in the book of Acts when they were told, stop preaching in the name of Jesus. They said we ought to obey God rather than man. When man says, this is what you have to believe, this is what you have to practice, we played the music, you didn't dance, we played a dirge, you didn't mourn, you better do what we, as the popular culture, tell you is the right thing to do right now. We say, no, we ought to obey God rather than man. And that's what John was like as a prophet. And they often... Prophets often bear rejection. I want to turn here for a moment to Jeremiah chapter 20. Jeremiah chapter 20. I'm going to read a lengthy passage here. Uh, we'll start at verse 7 and read through the end of the chapter. Because I want you to realize again how difficult it is for someone who determines to follow Jesus. What did he say? If you want to follow me, you must be willing to take up your cross daily and follow me. It's hard for a prophet because he can face rejection and even get thrown in prison or his life taken. Here's Jeremiah. Jeremiah complaining to the Lord. 
having doubts. What? Jeremiah, you bet. Oh, Lord, you deceived me, and I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. When she's talking about the judgment the Lord was going to send, speaking through him. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and approach all day long. But if I say, I will not mention him or speak any more in his name so, so I can avoid this persecution, this rejection. His word is in my heart like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. I hear many whispering, terror on every side. Report him. Let's report him. All my friends are waiting for me to slip, saying, perhaps he will be deceived. Then we will prevail over him and take our revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. You, you see him going back and forth? Do you see what can be for any human being, even a servant of the Lord? I will tell you one time I was preaching at a church in Connecticut. And I was, I was actually, I think I was preaching at the time about Elijah and how he got discouraged after the great victory. And, and I said to the congregation, you know, even pastors can get discouraged sometimes. And I, the pastor of the church was sitting behind me and I said, isn't that right, pastor? Silence. I felt, like, uh oh, I've stuck my foot in it. And finally he said, Not so as anybody'd ever know. <laughs> yes, men and women of God get discouraged too. And here was Jeremiah. <sighs> but the, he goes back and forth between saying, I, They're persecuting me. But when I try not to speak these things so they won't get after me and try to destroy me, and it's like a fire set up in my bones, and he's back and forth, and now here he's, he's talking about they want to take revenge on him. But the Lord is with me like a mighty warrior. So my persecutors will stumble and not prevail. They will fall, uh, fail and, and be thoroughly disgraced. Their dishonor will never be forgotten. Oh, Lord Almighty. You who examine the righteous and probe the heart and mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you I have committed my cause. And now he goes even higher. Sing to the Lord. Give praise to the Lord. He rescues the life of the needy from the hands of the wicked. Now here's the same prophet. Here's what he says. Cursed be the day I was born. <laughs> Cursed be the man who brought my father the news, who made him very glad, saying, A child is born to you, a son. May that man be like the towns the Lord overthrew without pity. May he hear wailing in the morning, a battle cry at night, uh, at noon, excuse me. For he did not kill me in the womb with my mother as my grave, her womb enlarged forever. Why did I ever come out of the womb to seek trouble and sorrow and end my days in shame? This is the man of God. God used him not only to speak to the people of his day, but to write scripture inspired by God. And he's back and forth, back and forth. Doubts and faith, doubts and faith. He holds on to the end. But just like John the Baptist and just like so many others, he holds on to the Lord and he holds on and speaks the truth. True seekers. True seekers are not just looking for a populist image. Are not just looking for what appeals on the outside and appeals to the eye. They're looking for truth. Real truth. They look past populism and image. Oh, they see it. But the true seekers look past that. They hunger for truth and reality. They want something that will reach into the deepest part of their being. Because they have learned that the simple pleasures of this life are not the most important things.
Oh, God is not totally against pleasure. He's totally against some pleasures, yes, because they're sinful. But he's not against pleasure. He created pleasure. But he's against pleasure becoming our God. That's what the Apostle Paul said about the end time as he was speaking through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Men will become lovers of pleasure more than or rather than, as it says in the NIV, God. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's the thing. Are we allowed to experience pleasure? Yeah. Simple things in life like sitting down to a meal. Do you realize how many people on this planet have not had a thing to eat today? And we complain because, well, that isn't what I was looking for for supper. God says what's most important is what reaches the innermost man and woman, the deepest part of their being. True seekers want truth. You see, to reach our world, we don't need to be popular or outwardly impressive. We need to know, live, and speak the truth of God. Let me repeat that because that's the bottom line lesson from this Bible study tonight. We don't have to impress people with things on the outside We need to know, live, and speak the truth of God. Not what the world proclaims as truth, but what God, whose son Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. What God says is truth. And I will tell you this, the most important part, they're in order of importance when I say no Live and speak the truth. Most important, know the truth. Discover it. Second most important, live the truth. You can't live it until you know it. You've got to know it first, then you've got to live it. And finally, proclaim it. Speak it. I will tell you this personally. God has given me gifts of communication. I've worked in a number of fields in terms of studying the Bible, teaching the Bible, preaching the Bible. I've written songs. I sing songs. I've written books. But I will tell you this. We need to proclaim the truth. But more importantly, we need to live the truth. And I will tell you, I want to do both. I'm called to do both, but it is a lot easier to speak the truth and to live it. Still, it is more important to live the truth than to speak it. We need both, but first we have to live it. What did they go out to see? They went out to see someone who spoke the word of God in truth and with the anointing, and with authority. That's who John the Baptist was. Even though he got discouraged and had doubts and questions, and in the end of his life is asking the Jesus who he proclaimed was the Lamb of God, he said, are you really the Messiah? I want to remind you as I close to something that I have shared with a number of people in recent days. It's because it's so important. I, I, it, it begins with this. This is not the point I'm making, but it lays the foundation for it. Many years ago, I heard a missionary say, you need to read a psalm or two aloud every day. Not just read it. Read it aloud. I heard that. And I thought, that sounds pretty good. But it was a lot of years before I began to practice it. And I am glad when I did. And one of the many things I have learned is God will put up with his servants, even under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing scripture like the Psalms, which is what the Psalms is, the word of God, expressing their doubts, their concerns, even complaints. 
God, where are you? Have you abandoned me? Oh God, my enemies are out to destroy me. And yet, over and over, they come back to the truth. But you are the God who reigns. You are a good and a merciful God. And you are going to give, and I will praise you. You see, both sides. God allows us to speak to him from our hearts as he did the psalmist. I spoke with a woman last Saturday at the, at the Hope Again Care Center who, was, who, who said something of discouragement, and she really felt bad about it. And I, I said to her, read the Psalms. God will hear you when you say that. Don't wallow in that, but God will hear you. He hears your heart. He heard Jeremiah back and forth between praising God and complaining. <laughs> he heard John, and through his son Jesus, he sent word back. You tell him, yes, God has anointed me. I am the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, the son of the living God. Tell him about the miracles. And John died with his faith intact. Father, we thank you for this, your word. We thank you for the ability to gather together in the name of Jesus. And wherever two or three gather in that name, there you are in the midst. You have been here. Use your word to speak to us. Thank you, Father. May we go, having heard that truth, to live it and proclaim it as you give us opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Sorry I went a little long.